When you hear the phrase, in the beginning, what book of scripture comes to mind? Those are the first three words in the book of Genesis, and they're also the first three words in the gospel according to John. We read, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. John wants us to know that Jesus Christ was there in the beginning. As part of his premortal mission, Jesus Christ created the earth and everything on it. We can learn many lessons from Christ as the Creator. Let's explore one principle from the creation by looking at three verses. One from the creation, one from the mortal Christ, and one from Paul, who was teaching about Jesus. In the account of the creation we read, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. During Christ's life, the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Let's pause for a moment on this question, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? I want to point out two things. First, generally speaking, it was not legal for a woman to divorce her husband. That wasn't even a question. The question was, under what conditions can a man divorce his wife? Second, this was a question that was debated among Jews at the time of Christ. Some groups believe that it was okay for a man to divorce his wife for basically any reason. She burns dinner, you don't like the food, you write her a little note saying you're out and it's fine to divorce. Other Jews were much less permissive about divorce. That's why people are coming to Jesus about this topic. They're asking him to weigh in on a current issue. Jesus answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Notice that Jesus' response about divorce directly connects to God creating male and female and God joining the two in marriage. The Pharisees then said to Jesus, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? This is a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, in which Moses allows for divorce. The Pharisees are asking Jesus, Why does Moses allow divorce? And you're saying, No divorce. Jesus saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. The Savior's teachings here are very clear. The only valid reason for a man to divorce his wife is because of sexual infidelity. If a man divorces his wife and remarries, he is committing adultery. Let's pause for a moment and make a couple of clarifications. First, I acknowledge that this is a sensitive subject. I bring it up because it's something that Jesus talks about frequently. He forbids divorce twice in the book of Matthew, and similar versions of these teachings appear in Mark and Luke. It was such a common teaching of Jesus that the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians specifically cites Jesus as prohibiting divorce. Jesus also teaches this principle when he visits the Nephites. It's not a one-off teaching, it's something he repeatedly says. Second, to be clear, the church today does not strictly adhere to this teaching from the Savior. President Dallin H. Oaks said, In the temples of the Lord, couples are married for all eternity. But some marriages do not progress toward that ideal. Because of the hardness of our hearts, the Lord does not currently enforce the consequences of the celestial standard. He permits divorced persons to marry again without the stain of immorality specified in the higher law. Unless a divorced member has committed serious transgressions, he or she can become eligible for a temple recommend under the same worthiness standards that apply to other members. So just like Moses allowed divorce in his day, President Oaks is saying that the Lord allows it in our day. I'll say a little more about this in just a moment, but first, let's read our third passage from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, which is Paul talking about Jesus. He says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Note that this verse is directed to husbands, telling them to love their wives in the same way that Christ loved the church. How did Jesus love the church? He died for it. He sacrificed everything. We see this same idea in the temple ceiling. If you've been in a ceiling room before, you've probably noticed that the altar is placed in the center of the room. For millennia, altars have pointed to the death of Christ. 
For example, Abraham built an altar and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar, which was a similitude of God and his only begotten son. Elder Brucey Hafen described a time when he sealed a couple in the temple. As I invited them to come to the altar, he took her by the hand, and I realized that they were about to place upon that altar of sacrifice their own broken hearts and contrite spirits, a selfless offering of themselves to each other and to God in emulation of Christ's sacrifice for them. Picture the scene described by Elder Hafend. The husband and wife are on opposite sides of the altar. The bride and groom take each other by the hand, ready to sacrifice themselves to each other as Christ sacrificed himself for each of them. Whether one thinks of the altar or the hands clasped together on the altar, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is literally at the center of the sealing ordinance. When a husband and wife are sealed together in the temple, their marriage is no longer just about a man and a woman. The Savior is a central third party. So let's step back and look at these verses collectively. Again, I acknowledge that this is a sensitive topic. Many of us have loved ones who have been divorced, or perhaps we've been divorced ourselves. Depending on the circumstances, maybe that divorce has been a blessing, or maybe it's been a very painful process. What do Jesus' teachings mean for us today? Clearly, Jesus is not saying that you should stay in an abusive marriage. In context, Jesus is talking about men who were divorcing their wives for trivial or selfish reasons. And Jesus says, don't do that. A man might say, well, my spouse doesn't seem as attractive to me as she used to be, or she's got some annoying habits. Jesus says that is not a valid reason for divorce. Paul taught that Jesus didn't just fall out of love with us and leave us. On the contrary, he sacrificed his life for us. And that's how husbands should be. As Timothy and Kathy Keller, Christian leaders, write, On the cross, Jesus did not look down on us with a heart full of admiration and affection. He felt no chemistry, but he gave himself. He put our needs ahead of his own. He sacrificed for us. The Bible tells spouses not only to imitate the quality and manner of Christ's love, but also the goal of it. Jesus died not because we were lovely, but to make us lovely. He died, Paul says, to make us holy. Paradoxically, this means Paul is urging spouses to help their mates love Jesus more than them. It's a paradox, but not a contradiction. The simple fact is that only if I love Jesus more than my wife will I be able to serve her needs ahead of my own. Only if my emotional tank is filled with love from God will I be able to be patient, faithful, tender, and open with my wife when things are not going well in life or in the relationship. And the more joy I get from my relationship with Christ, the more I can share that joy with my wife and family. As we conclude our discussion of this principle, I want to be clear that I'm not in any way, shape, or form saying that someone who gets divorced is a bad person or anything like that. Clearly, as President Oaks taught, in our modern context, there are justifiable reasons for divorce, and there will be times that divorce is the best option. In our own marriages or looking to future marriages, a principle from the creation is that marriage between a man and a woman is essential to God's eternal plan. Each one of us might have a different set of applications for this principle. Somebody who is single might decide to start doing things today to strengthen a future marriage or to stop doing things that will weaken a future marriage. Perhaps some of us are married and we might find a completely different set of applications. Take a moment to consider how you might apply the principle Marriage between man and woman is essential to God's eternal plan.